This is probably going to sound funny, but I like learning. I like growing. I like developing as a person. My early days in the Jesus movement kind of set me up for that because, quite frankly, most of the people that I came into contact with, I was awestruck. I, I would look at them as like, wow, whoa, ooh. And thank God I had someone around that kind of kept me even paced, like Romaine, who kind of taught me not to be in awe of these men of God that were really just growing up like I was and learning and developing, you know. And I always figured that they had more than I did and they were smarter than I was and they were like, you know, really way out there. But one incident that changed my life forever was done by Chuck Smith, of all people. You see, Chuck Smith, in my day, people were kind of like in awe of being able to study the end times. You know, the world's coming to an end. Jesus is coming. It was getting exciting. We, we almost every night practically expected the Lord to return. While he is coming soon, and I still do know that he is coming very soon now, we never really took to heart what he was teaching us from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God and from the Holy Spirit series and things about studying on our own to show ourselves the prudent unto God, but also to become our own person. And at that time, different men that learned from Chuck and got anointed went out and actually became their own person in a lot of ways. Greg Laurie, a great evangelist. Mike McIntosh, a great prayer warrior. Raul Reese, a great discipler. Um, I mean, there were a lot of men that actually grew up in the Jesus movement that went on to become very individuals of their own type of ministry that God is using them for. Well, what happened to me was that one night after Sunday Night Study, I had come up to Chuck, you know, and I was never spoke to Chuck before. You know, I'd been working in the ministry at different times behind the scenes, you know, tape learning library and sound, all kinds of places. And uh, never really talked to Chuck, you know, just recorded him, but, you know, I'd heard all the tapes and everything, but not, you know, mano y mano. And so, I came up, you know, like most people do with my Bible, and I wanted to share something with him. And I said, you know, something about Ezekiel 42.20 and, you know, separation between the holy place and the profane, that how the temple didn't have to be destroyed, as Chuck was teaching at the time, that, you know, it probably would be destroyed before, you know, somebody misquotes me. And so, you know, I shared with him and said, look, this kind of looks like to me like the temple didn't have to be destroyed, you know, and like there, there could be a wall of separation between the two, and that would fulfill this word. And he goes, that's interesting. He says have to look at that. He says, that could be. I was ecstatic. I ran out of there with joy because I thought he'd just shoot me down. And then years later, as I was still in the ministry, I heard him teach on that, you know, and he taught that there could be, you know, separation. And I just was, wow, all so excited and ecstatic. Because you see, a lot of times we don't give credit for who we are and what God has done in us. I'm not trying to puff you up or blow smoke in your direction because, quite frankly, a lot of people are up in smoke. And I don't mean the funny smoke of marijuana kind. <laughs> Although, some of those people are out there. They think they can get away with it. But I'm not trying to tell you to be bigger than you are. I'm just trying to say, appreciate how far God has brought you. God wants to have you in intimate fellowship with Him. No, really. I... I, I kid you not, he's wanting you to be you, but in a way that he designed you to be, not the way you made yourself out to be. Because you see, everyone has this image of what they make themselves out to be. You know, I can put on this hat, you know, and kind of look like, hey man, I'm cool, you know, like I know how to do these things, you know, like I'm like, hey, we jeeping and jiving and we moving and doing it, you know, like kind of whatever it may be. Or, you know, I could flip it around and just go, Bebop <laughs> or doo wop, whatever. But the point is, whatever hat you wear, God has you where you are, as you are, the way you are, and He's changed you to make you and create in you a place and a vocation and an avocation of the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit that He could be inside you to come out of you at a specific time and purpose and place so He could use you and make you into the image of His incorruptible Son so that you could be a testimony to Him of what He's done in you to change you, to make you into who you are. So wonderful! Mwah!
beautiful. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe you don't get it. <laughs> okay. But the reason why I share all that is because you don't follow a man like a pastor. You don't follow a teacher like, you know, some great elder or deacon or great, you know, writing in the sky that you think you, oh, I want to be like them. No. You want to learn from them. You want to listen, but examine. You want to pay attention, but question. You want to sit down with the Word of God and not just read it, but hear it. You know, when God's speaking to you in your heart. He wants to develop you and make you into someone who does study to show themselves approved, the workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Not to chastise others or to say, you're wrong, says here, or you're right, says here, or I don't think you're right or wrong, says right here that I really don't know. But rather God, in his infinite mercy and grace, has extended to you long suffering so that you would learn eventually what his will is for you that you would become in time the fulfillment through time of his perfect plan and purpose for your life which is your salvation and to know him in a personal and intimate way that you've never known him in any other way before because you see you should be growing in that whatever it is that you're at growing in it growing up and fulfilling who you are not to stay the way you are but to be changed to use those things that God has placed in your life to create in you that image that he wants you to be today right now you're there you made it congratulations but more so than just being there he wants you to be aware and that's why we have devotionals and we have Bible time and we need to talk and you know kind of work out our salvation because it's kind of like a Proverbs 3 5 and 6 you know talk to the Lord you know and kind of trust him and don't think it through too much because you don't know what you're doing you know but kind of like ask him and everything so that you can kind of see the way that you should go directly rather than go indirectly the same place doing it the hard way maybe you could go the straight way because brought his way and great is the gate that leads to destruction but Narrow is the way that you should probably be walking because, quite frankly, that broad gate, man, it's pretty easy to go slip sliding away with it. But that narrow way kind of goes uphill, not downhill. And the higher you get, you sure don't want to fall off. So, for me, I choose to use, and I use things. I use the Bible. I use listening to God. I use praying to God. I use people and men of God. I use the internet. I use videos. I use you. I use me. You know, because I even listen to my own videos. Go, I said that. Wow, praise the Lord. I could use that. <laughs> maybe I should talk to myself more often, or maybe God in me should talk to you and me both because He's speaking to both of us as I'm speaking the words forth that He's placed within my heart in order to communicate to you that which His Spirit is going through in order to accomplish His purposes for both of us. You get that? <laughs> no? Uh, replay it. <laughs> You'll figure it out. But one of the challenges I have, and it's sometimes a blessing like today, is utmost for his highest. Because it always brings me to a place of realization of knowing God in a personal way. And not just intimately, but dramatically. God speaking. God opening the heavens. I go, ooh, did you see that? Oh boy. Friendship with God. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Genesis eighteen seventeen. The delights of his friendship. Genesis eighteen brings out the delight of true friendship with God, as compared to simply feeling nothing more than feelings. But there's something more about God's friendship than just feeling his presence occasionally in prayer or working ourselves up in the worship service to feel it like I, the presence of God was there. I got a big shocky news flash for you. The presence of God is here. 
all the time. You're just not aware of it. Yeah, you just haven't been paying attention. You got distracted. Sorry, you could have had it all the time, not just worshiping. But the friendship of God is this friendship that means to being so intimately in touch with God that you never even need to ask Him to show you His will because His will is obvious to you. You become close. You become intimate. You become real. It is evidence of a need not to ask him to show his will anymore, but it is an evidence of a level of intimacy which confirms that you are nearing the final stage of your discipline in the life of faith. Your discipleship is reaching its conclusion. When you have a right standing relationship with God, you have a life of freedom. Freedom! 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 Not that kind of freedom. <laughs> Although it works that way too. But you have a life of freedom, of liberty, and, dare I say, delight. <laughs> Not the kind of delights that you saw in the, you know, like Chronicles of Narnia. That's an English dessert. But the delight that comes in knowing the Lord. And even more so, delight yourself in the Lord thy God to give you the desires of your heart. It becomes delightful. Because you become full of that which God is giving you because you've delighted in the Lord. You are, literally, and have become, frankly, God's will. Yes, you. And all your common sense decisions are actually His will for you. Unless, unless, you sense a feeling of restraint brought on to you by a check in your spirit. Now, it's interesting because, you know, they use that check in the spirit and everybody's going to come up with kind of a different feeling, experience, way of saying, you know, unfortunately for me, you know, I don't get as many checks in the spirit as I get God saying, No! <laughs> I'm stubborn. I might get a check in my spirit, but I'm going to try to get away with it anyways. Maybe you're like me. You need a direct no. You can do that too. But you see, a lot of times I run smack into a wall, and then I know where the wall is. Or I run smack into a door, and I know where the door is, because it's shut. <laughs> but God really doesn't want to operate that way. He wants you to hear him whisper in your ear. He wants you to put a check in your heart where you feel like, eh, something's not right. If it doesn't seem right, it ain't right. You need to yield to that and then ask God for wisdom as James 1 5 says. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. In other words, he's not going to beat you up because you're asking. He's not going to say, well, stupid, you didn't get the message the first time. No, he says, look, you don't get the message, you need to ask. And that's what he means by abradeth not. He means he's not going to take a rope, which is braided, and beat you with it. He's going to say, no, I'm not going to tell you how bad you are. I'm going to give you wisdom liberally, more than you asked for. But you got to ask. So you see, common sense decisions can become automatically his will when you have programmed your mind that you might not be conform to this world, but you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is the perfect and acceptable will of God in Christ Jesus, that you would become His will for you in the day where you're at, as you are, where you are, with the people that you're around. You become His will. That's because you're checking in with Him all the time. Jesus said something interesting along the same lines. And maybe you'll get how this common sense thing, which isn't really common, can be perfect sense when you kind of put it into practical sense of the reality of knowing God in a personal, intimate way. Jesus said, I only do those things that please my Father. Sorry. Not going over there to the gladiator pit. Sorry. Not going over there to the Colosseum where the Jews were getting naked, you know, cutting themselves in order to run in the Olympics. And they had a Colosseum in Jerusalem. Sorry, I'm not doing all those things that everybody else wants to do. Doing it, doing it, doing it. I choose to do what my father says. And I, I want to do it in such a way that I'm willing to seek him out before the day begins, every day, to ask him for his will. So that I can go through the day knowing that whatever comes my way is his will. According to what he's purposed and not what I have. So you see, when I say things like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, I'm not kidding. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways. Get it? That means, before I get up in the chair, I'd ask God, do you want me to go there? Or do you want me to go there? You know, should I go around this way or this way? This way, I might catch my pant leg. This way, I can probably avoid the pant leg and, you know, like taking too long and you having to sit there and wait for the end of the tape to get over so I can get over to the computer and shut off the thing. Practical, but personally, it also fits. So, in the reality of the way that the Spirit of God works in our lives, practically, emotionally, spiritually, exponentially, and experientially, then we see that there are manifestations of how God chooses to work His will out in our lives, whether through circumstance, whether through emotion, whether through devotion, whether through the written word, whether through the audible, whether through the sensory, hmm, just doesn't feel right, whether through circumstances, the phone rings, now, that could be Satan, too. You know, He's calling you on the line to get you out of the recording. But the point is, as you deal with your day, practically, because you committed your way unto the Lord, as Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 said, then you can trust in those things that are coming your way because God ordained them. And God wants you to seek His will in every way that comes towards you. Because the things that come at you aren't about giving some guy, you know, some teacher or some elder, or some pastor, or some deacon or some person or some ministry or some, you know, devotion or even some book or some idea or even the scriptures. Elevation over personal relationship with God. He wants you to have a personal dynamic relationship that means you're interactive. You're making, you know, not making babies, but you're making interconnection. You are... I was going to say... Copulating them, but that's not the word I wanted. It was like the inter interaction of the divine with the practical. It becomes holy living. It is the... There's a word that's used for copulation that I can't think of it right now. It's kind of funny because I, it's like, you know, the way that you can say it generically without saying it specifically, you know. And it doesn't involve any four-letter words. But it also means to be connected in a way that you intersect. And so the interpolation, which isn't the word I'm looking for, of God and man comes true in you. You become God with us. You become God in us. As a matter of fact, you have God with you. You have God in you. That is the fulfillment of the destiny that God has always wanted for you to have. To hear Him, to see Him, to know Him, to experience Him, to love Him, and to be filled with Him in a way that you've never known before. You're never done in this life because every day is different. You are constantly renewing and reviewing your life to make sure that you're moving in that way that God wants you to go so that you can constantly be seeing the revelation of Jesus in this life as well as the end of the book that you've been going through stage by stage, literally learning to live out the Word of God as you live in the Word of Jesus, or the Word of Christ, so to speak. It's kind of a weird way of... I'll say it. I'll take a moment to say it anyways. There's kind of like a diphthong, kind of really crazy idea here that John played with when he was saying, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was, you know, in the beginning, you know, God was the Word, and blah, blah, blah. In the Word was a bird, and the bird was a Word, you know, not that song. But the point being is that the Word of God is a physical thing. It's the Bible. But the Word of God is also a spiritual thing. It's God's Word that when inspired by His Spirit can be understood as being God's Word. Otherwise it's just the recorded Word. So the practical man cannot receive the things of the Spirit because they're spiritually discerned. Well, they're spiritually quickened or made alive. Otherwise they're just practical words. The Bible is quite practical. That's why it's called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. It's also the name of Jesus, the Word of God, because He is the fulfillment and the exemplification or implementation of the Word of God, of what it should be from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation, of what the physical manifestation of the Word of God would be in heaven. You would look and see not a scroll, but Jesus, because He is the perfection and completion of the fulfillment of God's Word. So whenever you want to see the Word of God embodied, 
the Word of God, then you wouldn't look at a book or a scroll, you would look at Jesus. So Jesus is the Word of God. So we learn from the written Word of God. We learn from the verbal Word of God. We learn from the manifested Word of God, or embodied Word of God, or fulfilled Word of God. And that's who Jesus is. Isn't that kind of cool? No? Okay, well. No. In a sci-fi sort of way, if you're a sci-fi nut, or you're a techie, you know, techno-nerd, then you kind of love these kind of things because they kind of they kind of mesh, they kind of meld or metamorphosize your thought process into something that coalates, you know, and coalesces all these ideologies that you came up with in sci-fi into something that you could appreciate that most Christians can't because they don't have a sci-fi background. They don't get it. <laughs> but you like to go into interdimensional reality so you can conceive of not only God being in heaven but God being on earth at the same time because it's quite frankly pretty easy to do in sci-fi. But, don't go weird on it. It's got to be in the Word of God. You see, there's still parameters of understanding that we don't lean into, but we better appreciate what we are still comprehending day by day as we walk with Him, talk with Him, listen to Him, as we have the eyes of our understanding open and the ears of our hearts open to the appreciation of what the Holy Spirit is doing in you to make you into the image of His Son. The reality is, you don't need to be awestruck by anyone around you. You need to be inspired by how far God has brought you today to where you are now, no matter how you think of it. Because where you are today is so much farther, backslidden or not, up or down, however you look at it, doesn't matter. God sees it differently. But you are so much better today than you were yesterday. You just don't know it yet.